Hi, y'all. Okay, sorry about the delay. We're having some technical issues, um, but they're getting resolved. So give us one second and we will get started. All right. Uh -oh. Okay, I can't wait. Pop up something. I can't do it. <laughs> hey, Prophet. Be free. All right. Just okay. Go. Praise God. Again, thank you so much for your patience. I apologize. Um, we're just having some computer issues. So, anywho. Um, I'm going to pray quickly, and then we are going to get into the word tonight. Praise God. God, we just thank you. We honor you, Lord. Hallelujah. We bless your name, God. We we love you. We adore you, God. We lift you up high. We thank you for this time, God, of Bible study and dig into your word. We thank you, Lord, that uh, even as the word goes forth, that it falls on good ground. We thank you for the follow ground of our hearts already being broken up, that we are ready to receive your word, to lean into you, Lord God, for our faith to come and to increase and to grow according to the word of God. We appreciate you and we honor you. We love you always. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. All right. So um, tonight we're going to talk about your righteous mind. Praise God. Because uh, that's what your mind is. It's righteous. And so that's what we're going to talk about um, tonight. So I have a lot of scripture references. Uh, we're going to kind of uh, flip around a little bit. Some I'll read, some I'll just give. Uh, but let's get into the word. So we're going to go to Philippians 2. Philippians 2. And I'm reading verses 5 through 11 out of the New King James Version. Amen. Philippians 2, verses 5 through 11. And I apologize. I'm not, um, not trying to look at you, but my, my notes are over here to my, to my side. All right. So Philippians 2, verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of man. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death even the death of the cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every other name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in the heaven, of those on the earth, and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Praise God. So this is one of my favorite passages of scripture. I'm sure when you hear me pray, you've heard me pray passage of scripture before uh, in man. And so it just um, reminds us that we are to let or allow the mind of Christ to be in us. And so what does it mean to let the mind of Christ be in us? If you read this in the Message Bible, it says, think of yourselves the way Christ thought of himself. Amen. The way Christ Jesus thought of himself. And so that's really just it. That's the, the whole of it, the simple, you know, it just means to think the same way that Jesus thought. So he knew that he was one with God. And so we have to think of ourselves the very same way. Even though he was here as a man, he didn't think it robbery or wrong to think of himself as being equal with God. And that's the point that the Father wants us to get to, to know that we are God in the earth. Just like Jesus was born through the womb of a woman and walked here as a man, but was still God, he wants us to do the very same, that we know we are our men and encased in flesh, but that we are one with God. And so we are representatives of God in the earth. We are Jesus Christ now. Amen. So Jesus was crucified. He rose again. He ascended. Now he's seated at the right hand of the Father. And so it is now our responsibility to be Jesus in the earth for this day and this time. Praise God. So 
when you really kind of dig into this, that let um, there, it means to agree together, to be harmonious, to side with. Uh, it means even to savor, praise God. And so, you know, I was thinking like, man, wouldn't it be something if our our mind, our will, our emotions, like the whole of our personality and our very being, if it was always in agreement and in harmony with God's mind, if there was no discordance between my thoughts and God's thoughts, if, if all the time there was a beautiful sound that would come together because my thoughts were blending with the thoughts of God, praise God that my thoughts were one and were the same as, as the thoughts of God and the same thing that's on his mind. Think about how much better, how much more glorious, how much bigger, how much greater, how much more powerful uh, your life would be if you walked around, praise God, with the mind of Christ, with the thoughts of God, if you savored having God's mind. You know, like you savor something, you think about food, something tastes really good, like you savor it, right? Like you take your time eating it, like you enjoy every bite, you want to make sure you get all um, of the flavor out of it, you get the goody out of it. I think is my great or great, great grandmother used to say, I've heard my mom and grandma say that before. So you you want to um, really not only absorb Christ's mind, but also you want to savor it. You want to like dwell in that place and stay there, amen, where the thoughts of God are your thoughts. And so uh, we really can walk that way. We really can have the same thoughts of God, the same emotions that God has. We can do that because he's given that uh, uh, to us. And so um we can be in position where our answers are his answers. I mean, our emotions are his emotions. You can have his mind. You just got to let it be in you. You just have to allow the mind of Christ to become your mind. And if, if we would do that and really tap into it, we could actually literally manifest the mind of God here in the earth. I mean, think about the manifestation of the mind of God here in the earth realm. Praise God that people would be able to see uh, uh, what is on God's mind, what is in his heart, praise God. And that's the position that we wanted to get to, amen. And so that's what we're going to talk about tonight. So I want to go over to another scripture reference. We're going to go to Galatians 2, um, verse 20. And this is a familiar one as well, amen. Galatians 2 and verse 20, which is one book backwards, amen. We're going to go to Galatians. I'm going to read this out of, out of the New King James Version. And it says, uh, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So, you know, really what it comes down to is that it takes a, um, a daily dying of yourself in order to have the mind of Christ. A daily dying of yourself. Your flesh has to die. And I'm telling you this not just because I'm teaching the word tonight, but I'm talking about from everyday life experience. Your, your flesh absolutely must die. It's the only way that the mind of God can be your mind and can come across and be manifested through you. And so, um, as your flesh is dying, then your soul must be renewed uh, by the word of God, you know, um, and whatever it takes to do that, whatever it takes to kill this flesh. You know, sometimes when we're fasting, I say, Alexis, like, die, flesh, die, you know, like this flesh has to die. I want it to die every day. It needs to, you know, the Bible says, that we are to crucify our flesh daily with its passions and desires. Amen. So that means anything in this flesh, anything that the flesh wants has to be brought under subjection and submission to the word of God. And we got to beat it and kill this flesh on a day-to-day -day basis. Praise God. There are definitely areas in my life, in my emotions, in my will, in my personality that need to die. Praise God. That need to be crucified and to die to myself in order that the will of God uh, might live. And you know, when you think about it, crucifixion was one of the most horrible, painful ways to die, um, and probably still is the most. Um, you know, and if you think about that and the sacrifice that the Lord went through for us, physically, he died that way. And so I don't think it's too much to ask for us then to crucify this flesh um, uh, in a spiritual sense. Amen. Nobody is asking you to go around and impale yourself, but certainly the desires, the lust, the wrong thoughts, the carnal thinking, all of that has to go in order for the mind of Christ to be made manifest um, through us. And, you know, crucifixion was like a 
slow, painful death. It wasn't just like a one and done, right? It wasn't just, you know, it's not the same as someone being beheaded or shot or any of those other horrible ways that people die. This was a slow, painful process that, praise God, the Lord went through for us. And so now we got to do the same thing day by day by day, second by, by second by moment. Glory to God. We have to crucify this flesh and beat this flesh into subjection uh, every single day. Our own will has to go. And so we want to get to a place where our flesh is uncomfortable every day, where there's not a time where our flesh feels like, oh, okay, we good today. Oh, she ain't, she ain't being spiritual. Oh, no, she ain't got Jesus, man. Oh, it's cool. I'm just going to go ahead and do what I want. Every day, our flesh needs to be uncomfortable. Every day, our flesh should be feeling like, man, it's rough. Why is she doing this to me? She ain't giving me nothing to eat. I can't watch no TV. I ain't listening to no music. Whatever it is. Whatever it takes uh, in order for your flesh to come into subjection and to know that you are one who is spirit. And so you're led by the spirit of God. Your soul is falling in line and being renewed by the word of God and that the flesh will just come along after. Because really, the only thing we need this flesh for is to come along after, right? We just need the flesh to, to carry out the physical actions of us doing the kingdom, living the kingdom and doing the work of the Lord. But we don't really need the flesh for any other thing, you know, in terms of spiritual or kingdom kind of stuff, right? But you need it to act out whatever it is the will of God is. So other than that, your flesh should be dead. Your flesh should be uncomfortable. Your flesh should be mad at you on a day-to-day -day basis, praise God, because your spirit should be how you're living your life, amen, and your soul being renewed and uh, refreshed and washed by the water of the word. Praise God. And so as we do that, even as the, the scripture said that it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I live now in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. And so if we, we live like that, then what people will see is the word of God, Jesus Christ himself. The word will be made manifest here in the earth um, by us and, and through us. And so, you know, as I was thinking about this, um, I'm reading a couple of books right now, and one of them is, is a book on marriage, but this was a good um, quote. The, the author is Amber Lee, and she said, uh, as Christ followers, we are not called to natural reactions, but supernatural responses. Praise God. So we want to get from a place where we are reacting to things and simply responding according to the mind of God. Amen. Where we are responding the same way Jesus Christ responded. That's the point that we want to get to, where there's no natural reaction that your first instinct isn't to go off on somebody or to be angry or to be offended or whatever else, but that we take a moment and we realize like, no, I got the mind of Christ, right? I, I am God's mind in the earth. So how would God respond to this situation? How would he take action? What would he do? What would be his plan? And that's the place that we want to come from and live from all the time. Praise God. If we have the mind of Christ, um, our answers in any given situation will be the, just the same as God. Amen. Our disposition will be just the same as God. Our demeanor will be just the the same as God, because we have the mind of Christ. Glory to God. If you even think about it, <clears throat> um, if you think about Jesus when he went in the wilderness, you know, I think most of us are familiar with this story, right? And so the reference is Matthew 4, um, verses 4 through 11. I'm not going to read all of it, but I'm going to kind of skip around a little bit. So if you think about um, the Bible says that uh, uh, Holy Spirit led him into the wilderness to be tempted. And he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, right? And so at the end of that, Jesus was hungry because it was 40 days and 40 nights. And so he was hungry. And so the devil, the tempter came to him. And so, you know, he came at him with all these different things. And so starting in verse four is really what I want to get into here because, um, the enemy came and tempted him. And the first thing that Jesus said was, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Now the devil, then he tempted him some more. He took him up, you know, and said, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down. He'll give his angels charge over you, blah, 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 right? And Jesus said, again, it is written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God, right? The devil did it again. Now he took him up somewhere else. He showed him all the kingdoms of the world, said, I'll give you these kingdoms if you fall down and worship me. And Jesus said, away with you, Satan, for it is written that you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. And then the devil left him and the angels of the Lord came and ministered uh, to Jesus. And so 
you know, the whole point of sharing this is what did Jesus do in a situation when he was tempted? He gave the enemy the word of God. What did Jesus do when he was hungry? He gave the enemy the word of God. Amen. What did he do when he was annoyed? Because I'm sure the devil was getting on his nerves at this point. He gave him the word of God. What did he do when his flesh wanted to rise up? Not only just in anger, but he was hungry. I'm sure he was like, okay, yeah, go ahead and turn that stone into bread because I'm going to make a sandwich. I'm hungry. But he gave him the word word of God, no matter what the situation, no matter what the emotion, no matter what the trigger, no matter what the temptation was, the Lord gave him the word of God. And so that's what we have to do. If you would have the mind of Christ and get so renewed in your mind, in the spirit of your mind and wash your mind in the word of God by the water of the word, praise God, and get your mind renewed to the point where you know you have the mind of Christ and in every situation you can give the word of God. Amen. In the natural, in the spirit, you know, people who may come at you wrong or whatever, you can give them the word of God. People who come at you who may need something, who need to be ministered to, you can give them the word of God. And certainly when the enemy comes, instead of cowering or running in fear or being angry or trying to catch up and be on the defensive, we will give him the word of God. Jesus answered him with the word. The word answered him with the word. And so we want to be the walking word. And the only thing we should answer with is the word of God. Praise God, the word and the word alone. Amen. That's what Jesus did. Praise God. And so this is a, a perfect example of how someone acts when they have the mind of Christ, when they know that they are God's mind walking in the earth, because what would God give? He would give the word. He is the word. His only answer is going to be the word of God. And so that's what Jesus did when the enemy came over and over again to try to tempt him. He gave him the word of God. Amen. That and that alone. And so if we have his mind, then we can talk and think and act just like Jesus does. Praise God. We can think and speak and decree and stand and believe and defend with. Amen. And be on the offense with the word of God at all times. Glory to God. So, you know, the other thing we got to kind of think about, okay, we're going to be Christ's mind uh, um, and let this mind be in us that was also in Christ Jesus. We have to know what was his mind or what was on his mind or however you um, want to put it. And so I don't think that there's any way our natural minds could ever uh, truly comprehend what God's mind is. You know, it's just too great, too vast, too deep, too powerful uh, uh, to really be able to understand again in our natural selves um, uh, what God's mind is. But there are a few things that I just want to talk about quickly. Um, and so as we, we go over this, I want there to be a uh, you know, it, it takes a supernatural kind of faith and revelation um, in order to really to grasp or to understand um, that you can have God's mind, that you really can. So whatever was on his mind can be on your mind just the same. It can be your mind. Those can be your thoughts. So we're going to talk a little bit about what was Christ's mind. So the first thing um, is that his mind was righteous. His mind was righteous. It's part of the reason why I said we're going to talk about your righteous mind, because Jesus's mind was righteous. Second Corinthians 5 and 21 tells us that we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So we have imputed righteousness because he became righteousness for us. Amen. We are now considered the righteous. We have been restored to that place of righteousness and, and right standing with God. So Jesus knew he was the righteousness of God. That is the reason why he could live a life of holiness, why he could be tempted in all manner, tempted with everything that we have ever been or will ever be tempted with and was still able to stand and live a holy life and to be holy um, before God, just as he commanded us to be holy as he is holy. And so he knew that he was righteous. And because of that imputed righteousness, we can walk and live the very same. Amen. Uh, uh, we talk about all the time, the kingdom of God is on the inside of us. What is the kingdom? Righteousness peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is living in you. So righteousness is living in you. The kingdom is living in you. And the mind of Christ is living on the inside of you. Praise God. Jesus had integrity so we can have integrity. Just the same. He lived right and righteously so we can live right and righteously. Praise God. Everything about Jesus is right. And if we would get ourselves in a position where we have the mind of Christ, everything about us can be right too. Spiritually. I ain't talking about flesh 
stuff, right? But your mind can be renewed to a point where you are just living from your spirit. And your spirit is a part of you that is connected directly with God. It's the part of us that came from God. It was the part uh, of Adam, a man uh, um, that the Lord wrapped into flesh, right? It, it was, it was uh, God, the Father's spirit was then wrapped into flesh and and a soul was put in. Amen. So if we live from our spirit, that means that we are living from God. We're living from our God place. That's who we really are. Praise God. And so we can be the righteousness of God here in the earth. Praise God. Uh, uh, and so the, the other thing or the next thing I believe that, that Jesus's mind was, is it was strategic. It was strategic. Um, if you think about it, there was purpose to everything that Jesus did, right? He didn't um, waste one word or action. There was nothing that Jesus Christ did that was like, a, you know, just like a oops or a, it just kind of happened. It didn't mean anything, right? From spitting in the dirt, from drawing a line in the sand to where he went to telling, you know, um, them to go and open the fish's mouth and let's go over here. We must need to go to the other side and the boat getting in the boat at the time he was in the boat and laying down on the pillow at the bottom of the boat and telling people everything that he did was strategic. There was purpose behind everything. And that's it. He was intentional. Praise God. And the people of God, we got to be the same way. We have to be strategic. No more can we live our lives like day to day, willy nilly, just kind of, you know, going with the flow, sort of seeing where the wind is going to blow us. And then once we get there, we'll figure it out. And then, you know, we'll pray and we'll see what the Lord says. No more of that. Praise God. We have to be in a point where, at a point where we are so intentional about our lives. We are so intentional about our actions. We are so intentional, uh, intentional about where we go and who we talk to and the decisions that we make, the house that we buy, the car that we drive, the clothes that we wear, the things that we tell our children. Amen. We have to be intentional intentional about everything that we do because there is no more time to be wasted. We are in the last, right? I mean, we know that the noisome pestilence is out here. We are in the last days, praise God. And so at this point, we got to be intentional, uh, intentional, excuse me, about everything that we do. Just like Jesus was, he was intentional. And if you look at his life, um, you know, and, and you study his life out, everything led up to his ministry at the age of 30. He spent 30 years in preparation for three. 30 years in preparation for what the Lord would do through him in three. Praise God. And once he went and, and you know, really launched into full ministry, everything that he did, it says he went about doing all kinds of good. Praise God. And making people in every way whole. You got to be intentional if you're going to make everybody that you come into contact with whole. You got to be intentional if you're going about and just doing good. There has to be a plan in place. There has to be some strategy behind what you're doing and certainly some purpose that is propelling and compelling you forward. And so that's the way that he would want us to live. He's a master strategist. And if we have access to his mind and his mind can be downloaded into our minds, then we can live our lives the very same way. Praise God. The next one, I don't even think I'll spend a lot of time on, but it's love. His mind was love. Praise God. Everything that Jesus did, ever, everything that he has ever done and ever will do is from a place of love because he loves us so much. Praise God. He loves us so much. Amen. Uh, uh, his plans for us are because of love. We know that his death and his burial and his resurrection was because of love. His kingdom is based on love and his thoughts towards us are solely based in love. He wants us to live a good life because of love. He wants us to expand the kingdom because those who are not a part of his kingdom yet, he loves them and he wants us to get them back just like he won us back. Glory to God. And so everything God does is love. And so, you know, again, we've talked about this before. If you can get to a place where you have revelation of the love of God for you, it will change your entire life. I'm telling you, uh, it was years uh, uh, after being saved that I finally started to understand that everything God does is because he loves me. Everything he's called me to is because he loves me. Even the things that I go through that he brings me out of, he does it in love. Praise God chastises me because he loves me. Amen. Corrects me because he loves me, calls me, raised me up 
delivered me out of things, amen, and has these, these awesome, wonderful plans for me because he loves me. So if you get revelation of the love of God, you can understand why you can have his mind. He wants you to have his mind, amen, and to be his mind uh, here in the earth. Glory to God. And so his mind was love as well. The next thing is that uh, forgiveness was on his mind, or his mind is uh, uh, forgiving. It's forgiving. Praise God. Um, that's just his nature. We know that. That we know that. That's why um, he was manifested. That's why he was born through Mary. That he came down here um, simply to forgive our sins and to restore us to the Father. So forgiveness, and I would add to that restoration, because for us too, you know, as people of God, we. Um, we, we want to restore our brothers and sisters who are lost. We want to restore them to relationship with God, just like somebody prayed for us or ministered to us, or we went to church and heard or whatever the case may be, the word of God, and we were restored in our relationship. Jesus wants us to do the same thing to everyone else. So forgiveness and restoration were on his mind. Amen. If you think about it, even when he went and healed people, you know, he would say to them, your sins are forgiven you. Now go take up your bed and walk, or you've been made whole, or whatever it is, right? So, so he he always had forgiveness on his mind, amen, and restoration to relationship with the Father, so that we could walk in. Uh, and I believe he did that so that the people that he ministered to who got healed. Um, so that it wouldn't, the healing wouldn't just be it, right? You got to be restored to something after you get healed. It's fine for your leg to work in this moment, but if you walk away not knowing that you've been restored to health, then your leg is going to be paralyzed all over again, right? You have to have revelation of restoration, amen? That that uh, what the Lord does when he delivers us, when he heals us, whatever the situation may be that he brings us out of, then not only do we come out of that thing, but then we are restored to where he would really have have us. Praise God. We're restored to righteousness. We're restored to health. We are restored to fellowship with the Father. And so as he forgives and he loves, he always restores. Praise God. And that's the same thing that he wants us to do, to minister to people. Amen. The next thing um, is obedience. Obedience. So whatever the Father said, that's what Jesus did period. Like there was no, you know, we talked, I think all of us at some point when we've ministered the word, it talks about like how Holy Spirit might tell you something and you'd be like, are you sure? Like, do you really want me to go talk to that lady over there at the, because I don't know that you, is that really you? Are you, is that, are you sure, Lord? Is that what you want me to do? But Jesus never questioned the Lord. He never questioned the father, right? He was always obedient. And in the first scripture reference that we, we read, he was obedient to the point of death, amen? Even the death of the cross. He was just sold out, totally obedient. Father, not my will, but your will be done. You know, even when he prayed in the garden of Gethsemane, uh, you know, uh, uh, let this cup pass from me. But Father, nevertheless, if it be your will, you know, that if it be your will, and that was Jesus' attitude, that's what was on his mind. And so we have to be uh, uh, the same way. I read in a book, um, Let This Mind by Frances Hunter, she said, Jesus never questioned the Father. He never questioned the plan, the ability, or the desire of the Father. And the people of God have to be the same way, where we never question the plan of God for our lives, like in terms of doubt, we never question it. We never question the ability of God. We know that he is well able and more than able to do everything that he said he would do. And we never question his desire because his desire for us is always love. It's always good. It's always prosperity. It's always success. It's always victory. And so we can never question the plan, the ability, or the desire of God because Jesus never did. And we had his mind. Praise God. He trusted uh, the father fully and he was obedient to death. Amen. Um, the next thing is victory. Victory was on his mind. Victory was on his mind. So we know that his life was purposed right from the beginning. The only reason he came was to, to get us, amen, to, to get us back, to win us back. And so, you know, he was manifested only to die, and to destroy the works of the enemy, praise God. And so um, when he was manifested and born through the womb, womb of a woman, from even from before then, I shouldn't even start there, before then, way back in eternity, uh, Jesus had that victory on his mind. From, from the point 
where Adam fell and, and a plan had to be put into place to, to win us back. He had victory on his mind through everything that he went through for us. He saw victory and not just his own victory as he destroyed the works of the enemy. He saw our victory. Praise God. That's what he was really looking at. That was the prize, the joy. The Bible talks about the joy that was set before him. That joy was the, the victory that he was going to give over to us. The joy was knowing that we would win win because he came. Glory to God. The joy was knowing that as he came and destroyed and obliterated the enemy and all of his evil works and broke the bonds of sin and hell and death in the grave, the victory, the joy that he saw was the victory that is now conferred over to us. Glory to God. And so that's what was on his mind. Amen. That's why he continued. That's why he fulfilled the plan and purpose of God for his life because he saw victory. He saw his people living in victory. Glory to God. And so we have that same victory. I was reading a quote from Apostle, and, and she said that you are programmed to win. You're programmed to win. You're programmed to walk in health. You're programmed to be successful and to be victorious. It is built into you. Glory to God. Your operating system is one of victory. So anytime you are in a situation where you're not coming out on top, where you're not... Um, where you are, I don't want to say losing because we don't lose, but where things are not, you know, going in your favor and not working out and there's some slip up, some mess up. Amen. There is a problem in your internal operating system. Something is wrong with your programming because you are programmed to win. That's all you can do. You are programmed in victory. You were created in victory and restored to victory at the point that Jesus Christ died and rose again and crushed the head of the enemy. Glory to God. And so if there's ever a time when you are not operating in victory, then you got to go get your, your hardware checked or your, your motherboard or your something. I don't know. I wish Donnie was here. I could ask him what all that stuff means, but something is off. Praise God. There's a glitch. There's a bug. There's a virus in the system. If you are not living your life in victory, because that is the whole reason that the Lord died. Praise God. That's the whole reason that he was made manifest. Amen. That we can have victory over the enemy. Glory to God. And so if victory is programmed in you and victory is what was on his mind, and now you have his mind, glory to God, then you should be walking and living and talking and manifesting victory every day of your life. Glory to God, victory in every area. Amen. Hallelujah. And, and the last thing that I'm going to talk about in terms of what was God's mind, uh, of Jesus Christ's mind, his mind was the glory of God revealed in the earth. That's what was on his mind. That is a part of the mind of God, the glory of God revealed here in the earth. And so I'm here to tell you that now you have been called to that very same thing, that now that is your mind, glory to God, to reveal the glory of God here in the earth. The revelation of God's glory is who you are. That is what your mind is composed of. Glory to God. Hallelujah. So, so we have to... Um, believe that we are the glory of Jesus Christ here manifest in the earth, that as he left the earth, that, that glory, amen, was transferred over to us. And so now we are the revelation of the glory of God. We are, we are the glory of Jesus Christ revealed, amen. Uh, that's what he has called us to, even as he prayed in John 17, that we would be one with him, even as he's one with the father, amen. We are one with Jesus Christ. We are partakers of the divine nature. Talk about that in first Peter. Amen. So if we are partakers of the divine nature, that means that glory is a part of your DNA. Victory is how you've been programmed and glory is a part of your DNA. Glory to God. Hallelujah. That means that everything that you are should be revealing the glory of God in the earth from, from a medical or a natural standpoint. What DNA, DNA is the code that makes you who you are. And it includes in there what you look like, the way you talk, whether or not you're going to have a dimple whether your hair will be curly or straight or whatever, right? And so if glory is written into your DNA, then that's what people should be seeing. It should be your phenotype. Glory to God. That's the word for it in the natural in terms of what you look like and your features. That's your phenotype. Amen. So glory is the phenotype, hallelujah, of the people of God. Glory is what we should be revealing, what we should be looking at. It's what people should see when they come into contact with us. It shouldn't be, oh, her eyes are brown, her hair is this color or that. They should see the glory glory of God revealed.
revealed here in the earth because glory is who we are. It's written on the inside of us. It's in our internal code. Glory to God. It's the way our cells work. It's the way our bodies, our tissues are put together. It's the glory of God revealed here in the earth. Hallelujah. We are the revelation of the glory of God, amen? That's the, that's what he has uh, uh, called us to be, is to reveal that very same glory in the nature of God here in the earth. It, it, the, the inscribed character of God is on the, on the inside of us, amen? The anointing of God is on the inside of us. The power of God, the manifestation of God is locked up in our DNA. And so now we have to reveal who we are. The Bible talks about the revelation, the manifestation of the sons of God. The entire world is moaning, it's groaning. And right now, the earth is crying out like never before. And so we must reveal ourselves as the son of God, as the sons of God. Glory to God. Amen. And so the glory of God revealed is the other thing that was on his mind. Praise God. So the next thing uh, I want to talk about quickly. Well, maybe not so quick. We'll see. Um, but the scripture reference for this is Mark 1 verses 14 through 15. And I'm just going to read it. Mark 1 verses 14 through 15. Now, after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Praise God. So one point that I really want to stress here as we're talking about this is that um, the kingdom, having the mind of Christ, revealing the, the mind of God here in the earth, it's about repentance. It's about repentance. And you're like, well, that don't make sense. You just told me I was victorious and I was the glory. But here's the thing. I believe that um, this is one of the biggest issues or areas of, I don't want to call it lack, but a place where we could kind of shore up a little bit um, in believers. I think that this is one of the key things that keeps us from living in victory the way God has really called us or like living a victorious life across the board um, because there's a lack of repentance in some area. I believe we're all saved. We love God, right? That's not the issue. I'm not talking about um, repentance in terms of like salvation and, you know, coming into relationship with God. But I believe that there are areas in our lives that we still need some deliverance in. And repentance is key to deliverance. You cannot walk fully in deliverance until you have repented, for real repented, okay? And so, if we don't repent in some of these areas, then it keeps us from truly having the mind of Christ. And I'm explaining why. So our, our carnal nature uh, or our flesh or our unrenewed mind or, you know, our will that's not submitted or, or, or our emotions um, are fighting against Christ's, Christ's mind being manifested on the inside of us. The Bible says in Romans 8 and 7 that the carnal mind is enmity against God. That means that it is literally fighting against, it is an enemy of God. If your mind is unrenewed in any area, that area is an enemy of God. Think about that. It's an enemy of God. If you have not repented uh, and gotten your mind renewed in a specific area, that area of your mind, of your life, of your will, of your personality is an actual enemy of God. It's an enemy of God. Okay. And so if we don't repent, then there's going to be this constant struggle in our minds in whatever that particular area is, there will be a constant struggle against the thoughts of God, against the mind of God, against the mind of Christ being made manifest because it's an enemy of God. Glory to God. And so I want to talk about repentance. Okay. And so there are a bunch of words for repentance, some um, in the Greek, some in Hebrew. Um, so I'm going to go over a few of them. I'm going to try to pronounce them. I don't know how to say these words. I'm just going to kind of make it up. And, um, you know, if you want me to spell it, I can. But, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. We'll see. So, anyway, I'm going to just talk about seven of them. I'm not going into long definitions. I'm just giving the word in order to give an understanding um, of kind of where I'm going with this. So, the first word is nakam, N-A-C-H-A-M. That first word for um, repentance means to be sorry. So, that's like when you regret a bad choice, you know, something you did and you, you feel bad about it. You're sorry about that. Okay. Yes, that's correct. Thank you. Elder Jason, knock them. 
The next one is uh, Shawub. Shawub, okay? S-H-U-W-B. S-H-U-W-B. That means to turn back. Um, this is more about like, okay, for instance, when a baby touches a hot stove and they turn back or they, they withdraw, okay? That's that kind of repentance, when you withdraw because of whatever, whatever happened. Uh, I'm gonna I can type it in here because I see you had a you put question. I'll type them as I'm going. That way you guys can see them. Okay. So that was the second one. Shwoop. That's the turning back. The next one is nokum or something like that. This means to regret. To regret. Okay. You regret. I think we know what regret means. The next one is the same except it's like nikum, nishum, something like that. That one is when you have an emotional concern for others. So this is like um, you feel bad. Whatever you did, you feel bad about the effect it may have on someone else, okay, or whoever else was involved. That's an emotional concern for others. The next one, Meta Noah. This one is the one that we are familiar with that Pastor Terrence talks about all the time, prays about all the time. This means to change your mind for the better or to change your attitude towards sin, to change your mind for the better, or to change your attitude towards sin, okay? The next one, meta, meta, that's a long one. That means that you re regret the consequence of sin, but not necessarily the cause, okay? So that's more that you're sorry that you got caught. Okay, so you're sorry about now what you have to face because you sinned, but not necessarily sorry about the cause of the sin. And then the last one, and we will move on. That one I'm not even going to try to say. And that really means irrevocable. It means irrevocable when you're talking about repentance, okay? Irrevocable. So the reason that I wanted to go over these different words to show you really what um, everything that repentance is really composed of or, or all the things that kind of make up true repentance. True repentance encompasses all these words or all these different types of repentance. So there has to be a feeling sorry for what you've done or said. There has to be a drawing back from it. So drawing away, taking yourself out of the situation, not touching the hot stove anymore. There has to be a regret that you did it. So you have to feel bad enough to where you wish you had never done it to begin with. There must be some regret. Then you have to either, you know, feel bad or be concerned about the others that are affected by your sin. Because believe you me, any sin that you commit uh, affects everyone else that is connected to you, Right. And that can be something as simple as a wrong attitude because your kids see you got a bad attitude. And so now they're affected by that sin, right? So there has to be uh, um, being concerned about them. Then there, then, then there has to be a change of mind or attitude. Then you have to turn away. You have to change your mind about whatever that thing is. So it can't just be, Lord, I'm sorry um, that I'm impatient and I treat my poorly, but you have to change your mind about it into the mind of Christ, right? You have to change your mind about the way you think about whatever it was you said or did to that person, right? Or whatever the sin was or, or whatever. I think you know what I mean. Then you must regret the consequence. So now I feel bad. I've repented about it. I'm changing my mind about the way I talk to my spouse, but now I have to regret and feel bad about the consequence because now there's damage that's been done to my marriage or to my spouse. I have to deal with that consequence and feel bad about it and own up to it and take responsibility for it. Praise God. And then the last part of it is making an irrevocable decision that you will not walk in that way again. That's true repentance. Doesn't mean that you're perfect and that you'll never sin again. But it, you, you make a decision that once you've done all of this, you regret, you turn away, you, you, know, you say, I'm sorry, you deal with the consequence, you, you minister to to those that you may have hurt in the process, you must make a decision that you will never think that way again. And this is the thing. Again, you're not going to sin. I mean, you're not going to go to hell because you got a bad attitude, right? Or you talk wrong to your husband or whatever it is. I'm not saying that. But you, after you repent, 
you have to make a decision that you ain't going to do it again. Because otherwise you just fall back into the sin, right? So, and, and part of making that decision is getting your mind renewed. You got to get in the word and let your mind be washed with the water of the word so that it's not even an option for you anymore. That's the irrevocable decision that you don't turn back to a thing. You don't change your mind again and again and do a 360 instead of a 180. You don't turn back to it or go back to the place of sin or go back to the place of unrepentance or go back to the place of an unrenewed mind because you are filling your mind with the word of God. You're washing your mind in the water of the word. You're washing that area of your personality. You're washing that bad attitude in the word of God. And you make a decision that will stick and stay. The Lord, I'm not going to do this anymore because I got the mind of Christ in this area. That's why I don't have to sin because I got the mind of Christ and he didn't sin. He didn't think about sin. He didn't turn back and say, you know what? Yeah. The devil tempted me. I'm just going to go ahead and do what he said and bow down and worship him. He made a decision that because he was the mind of God in the earth, that he didn't even have to do it anymore. He repented and stuck to repentance. Glory to God. And so if we truly want to be healed from, be delivered from, be better in the areas in our lives that are not lining up with the word of God or not lining up with victory, it takes a process of repentance. You cannot be delivered without true repentance. You cannot walk out of a thing without true repentance. And you can never have the mind of Christ across the board in every area without true repentance first. Praise God. And so that's the reason. And I, again, I'm not talking about big sins. I'm not saying that you went and murdered somebody, that you fornicating or you committed adultery or anything like that. But if your attitude is bad, if you ain't doing your children right, if you're stealing time on your job, if you don't respect authority, if you lie, a little lie, all of that stuff is sin. And sin has to be repented from. That's just what it is. Praise God. Doubt, worry, a lack of faith is sin. And you must repent from sin. Glory to God. That's the only way that we can get the mind of Christ. Amen. So at the end of the day, we have to do this process of repentance for those areas um, in our lives. It don't have to be a long run out thing. I'm not saying you got to take a day for every step. You know, this can just be a, a, a like, Lord, spend some time on your face and pray and seek God and say, I'm sorry, and let God deal with you and get up and walk away from it and let that be the end of it. And again, it doesn't mean you're perfect. It doesn't mean you're not going to be tempted to sin. It doesn't mean you're going to be not going to be tempted to fall back into that place. But once you make a decision, look, I got the mind of Christ. I got the mind of Christ. I have the mind of Christ concerning my marriage. I have the mind of Christ concerning my boss. I have the mind of Christ concerning faith. Glory to God. And let that be your confession uh, um, going forward because we got to get to the root of why we don't walk in victory, right? You got to get to the root of why you have not yet manifested the mind of Christ. I got to do when I was studying this, like every morning in my car on my way to work, I'm praying like, okay, Lord, show me today. What is it today? What are we going to do? How are we going to get out of this thing today and let the mind of Christ be my mind and be made manifest through me today? Glory to God. Because in, until we do that, we don't get to the root. And, and Donnie says all the time, whenever there's an issue, no, but there's a root to that. There, no, there is a root to that. Like, it's a root as to why you're impatient with the people at the grocery store. There's a root as to why homeless people discuss you would get on your nerve. There's a root to that thing. So there's either some generational stuff that got to be dug up and you got to be delivered from, or there's a flesh problem. That's what I like to say. There's a flesh problem, right? Somewhere your flesh has not been crucified, has not been submitted, has not been yielded to God. Amen. So we got to get to the root of it, the, the underlying thing. And whatever that area of sin is in our lives or unrepentant or, you know, just not even acknowledging it. Maybe you're ignorant of it. Maybe you just don't know. Praise God. We got to get to the root of it. Repent. Walk away. Get delivered walk in deliverance, make an irrevocable decision that we're not going to turn back and then keep it moving and manifest the mind of Christ. Amen. Amen. Praise God. All right. So the next thing I want to go to, um, as we're getting down to the end here, first Corinthians two, I'm reading 14 through 16, first Corinthians two, and we're starting at verse 14, first Corinthians two and verse 14. I'm reading from the New King James Version. 
But the natural man does not receive the things of the spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. We have the mind of Christ. Praise God. And if you read this in the Amplified, it says but we have the mind of Christ, the Messiah, and do hold the thoughts and feelings and purposes of his heart. That is just some good stuff to me. Praise God. You, I'm talking about you, you hold the thoughts and the intents of God's heart. That is awesomely, wonderfully good to me. You hold the thoughts and the intents of God's heart. Glory to God. His will is locked up in your mind. The will of God is literally locked up in your renewed spirit-led mind waiting to be manifest in the earth. His will is locked up in your mind. If you think about that, glory to God, if you can get revelation of this and get your mind so full of the word of God and build yourself up in faith to where you really believe that you have the mind of Christ, you can release the very thoughts and intents of the will and the mind and the heart of God here in the earth. I'm talking about releasing what God is thinking in the moment here in the earth realm. Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm talking about the stuff that the father uh, thought about, the, the things that are locked up in eternity, the revelation that, it, that, is, that is in God is locked up in your mind. If you would renew your mind and get to a point of faith to where you know and you are confident in what God has called you to, who you are in God, you can release the very mind of God in the earth realm. You can release the thoughts of God. People want to know, uh, uh, what do they say? God moves in mysterious ways and, and who has known the mind of God. And, but you can release the mind of God. You can release the plans and the purposes and the, the intent of God's mind is in your mind. That is some kind of awesome, crazy, my natural mind can't even conceive and fathom it kind of stuff. I have God's thoughts here. I have not only his thoughts, but the intention behind those thoughts is here. It's in my mind. It is in my mind and we can release it in the earth. Glory to God. Hallelujah. We can release it in the earth. I mean, this is something, if we could just really understand that the earth realm has been given over to us, right? It was given to Adam. We've been restored to Adam. And so to the place where Adam was. And so the earth realm has been given over to us. We have authority in the earth realm, glory to God. And so that being the case, the mind, the plan, the purposes, the will, the thoughts of God have to come through us. The manifestation of those things has to come through us here in the earth. And so we must renew our minds to the point where we understand that we have the mind of Christ. Amen. So everything that's on his mind, everything that he is, we can release out here uh, in the earth. Amen. We can, we can manifest it. Glory to God. And it cannot come through your natural mind. So I'm not talking about coming up with an idea or just doing something that's good. I'm talking about being God being God in the earth. Glory to God. We can do that if we would renew our mind and release the mind of God, because this stuff is foolishness to the natural mind. It's foolishness to the carnal mind. Glory to God. It takes revelation by Holy Spirit and renewing your mind with the word of God to understand that you can release the mind of God here in the earth. And here um, now, during this time, this whole COVID nonsense, there's, there's lack and famine and all kind of stuff going on. We must be the revealed mind of Jesus Christ. We absolutely have to. We must be the revealed glory of God here in the earth. Amen. That's, that's what we have to do. And I think that, you know, for the people of God for so long, we've thought about the church, the body of Christ, or even us individually being the hands of God, the feet of God, or I'm a prophet, so I'm the mouth of God. Like we think about that, but why not the mind of God? 
right? I mean, a body has to work according to its mind, according to its brain, right? I mean, at the end of the day. So if you, you can be if you can be the hands of God and the feet of God as you do his work, if you can be the heart of God as you show people the love of God, why not the mind of God? Why not the thoughts of God? Why not the intentions of God? Why not be able to reveal the wisdom of God here in the earth during this time? People are in need of the love of God. They are in need of wisdom. They're in need of the answer. They are, they're in need of a solution, amen? And not specifically only to this whole, you know, pestilence and all the nonsense that's going on. Um, but after this is all over, people going to need God, right? They're going to need an answer. They're going to need a solution. People still have to, to live, to pay bills, to take care of their children, to, to navigate their marriage, to, to be in the marketplace, whatever it is. And we can be the answer. We can be the answer. That's what he's called us to do because we have his mind. People know need to know how to manage their finances. They need to know how to raise their kids. They need to know how to navigate the healthcare system. They need to see miracle signs and wonders. They need to see the glory of God. They need to see wisdom. They need need to see love. And that is what God has called us to do. And we can be it right now during this time. And always, not that, not that there's anything particularly special about this time outside of that we're living in the last days and that this is an opportunity that we've been given and given. And so we must seize or take advantage of the opportunity um, that we've been given while the pestilence is out here doing what it does to give people the answer and to be God's mind and to manifest ourselves as sons. Glory to God. That's, that's really um, what it's about. So if you look at this, you know, when it says um, in the passage that we just read in, in 1 Corinthians 2 and 16, and it says, but we have the mind of Christ. And that have there, it means um, not only that we possess it, it does mean that we possess the mind of Christ, but it means that we are closely joined to it, that we wear it, and that we cling to it. Praise God that we cling to it. So be joined to God's mind be joined to his mind. Amen. Every morning since I started studying this, when I get up in the morning, I let, Lord, I let the same mind be in me that was in Christ Jesus. I have the mind of Christ. And not just one of those like nice things that we say because like, oh, we're Christians and we're supposed to, you know, be nice and love people. But no, like I, I, I have the mind of Christ. I think the same way Jesus thinks. Glory to God. And so cling to God's mind. Be joined to God's mind. Take possession of the mind of Christ and then use what you own. Once you own something, it's free. It's, it's, it's yours to use freely. You can do with it whatever you want, right? I mean, this is my house, so I can walk around wherever I want to. I can paint the walls whatever color I choose, right? So once you take possession of a thing, then you can use it. It's at your disposal. It's yours. You own it. You have rights to it. Glory to God. And by faith, being our title deed and our guarantee and the seal of Holy Spirit, we have a right to the mind of Christ. We have a right to utilize the mind of Christ here in the earth and to be his revealed mind here in the earth. So make a daily decision to have the mind of Christ, to allow it to be in us and every day. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. That's Ephesians 4 and 23. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind every day as you spend time in God's presence and as you spend time in the word of God. Ask him to renew, for your mind to be renewed with the word of God, to remove all of those old thoughts, amen, to show you places where you may need to repent or to turn away or places that you need to be delivered from or whatever the case may be so that we can have the mind of Christ and reveal the mind of Christ here in the earth. Glory to God. Amen. So I encourage you, praise God, know that you have God's mind. It's been given to you. It's yours. You don't have to ask for it. There's nothing that you have to do but allow it to be in you and renew your mind with the word of God. Get the word of God on the inside of you. Let your faith rise and grow so that you can live and manifest yourself as the mind of Christ here in the earth. Praise God. And that is the word of the Lord for tonight. Amen. Glory to God. Praise God. Any questions or comments before I um, go over some quick announcements? Praise God. Praise God. We have his mind, amen. 
Amen. Praise God. Amen. Okay, so I think um, just a couple things, of course, uh, on... <laughs> Amen. I'm laughing at Pastor Terrence. I'm sorry. Um, so, of course, on Sunday um, at noon, Generation Excellence is going to be live on Facebook. So gather your kids, spread the word. Amen. Um, live, Facebook Live, uh, noon on Sundays. And then at 1 p.m., um, we will have the kingdom take as always. I mean, it has been so just so, 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 so good. Praise God. So, um, join in. Amen. We ask that you please do not start a watch party because if you start a watch party, you have to leave the rivers page and then it kind of like goes to your own page and you're doing your own watch party. And then we can't see the comments or questions that people may have in your watch party. So we ask that you come on tune in and then share the video. There's a button down at the bottom of your screen, whether you're on your phone or on a the computer, there's a share button. All you got to do is share it. You don't necessarily have to put a long post out there or whatever, just share it to your page, write the post, whatever you want to do. But we ask that as you come on, please share the video. We want to get this word out here, get as many views as we can, get all the likes and the comments and the questions to address those things. So we praise God for the kingdom take and how well it's been doing. Um, and we will continue to to do that. Praise God. Um, I'm sure you all heard that Governor Pritzker has extended the stay-at-home order until uh, the end of May. So we will continue um, on social media um, via Zoom, via Facebook Live, um, some other things coming. Also, you can always catch the videos actually that um, go on uh, the, Kingdom Cake, the Kingdom Take um, from Facebook Live. Pastor Donnie has created a video gallery on the website, uh, website www rolkm.com. You can go there anytime and view, or of course, you can go to the River Space book page as well. So continue to invite people to watch the Kingdom Take and to like the River's page. Other things in terms of upcoming stuff, um, the men, um, brother to brother, will meet on the 2nd at 10 a.m., um, so please get the word out regarding that. If you need uh, the Zoom uh, meeting information, you can contact Elder Jason for that. And then Facebook Live for, yes, yes, thank you, Pastor Donnie, makefaith.org as well. That is Pastor's Ministry site. You can visit there as well to hear the word from Pastor. Um, and so you can go on there as well as the River site. Um, yep, don't forget to pay your tithe and give offerings. And then the last thing I was saying was that uh, One Flesh, the third Friday, um, will be back and in effect. Facebook Live, amen. So you can join in for that as well and get the word regarding relationships. Remember, that's open to everybody, not just married couples. Praise God. Is there anything else? Okay. Well, praise God. Thank you all for joining in. Um, I will be glad when we get back to the house of the Lord. But in the meantime, we will see you guys on Facebook and on Zoom. If you need anything at all, whether it is prayer, whether it's just to speak with someone, whether you have questions, you have technical issues, any of that kind of stuff, please feel free to reach out to any of the ministry staff. We are available via text, phone, or email. Um, we are praying for you all every day. We're praying for you, praise God. The intercessors are praying for you on a regular basis, praying for your families, praying for your strength. For those of you who have lost any loved ones, amen. Um, just know that Psalm 91 is your portion. We are covered by the blood of Jesus, his angels and camp around and about us, and we live and walk in victory. Praise God. Amen. I think that's it. So I will pray quickly and then we will wrap it up. Amen. God, we give you glory and honor. We thank you as always, God, for your word. We thank you so much, God, for the privilege of being able to hear your word, to feed on your word, God, and that faith comes and it grows and it increases as we hear the word of God. So we thank you tonight, God, for faith being rooted, grounded, developed, and growing up and maturing in the truth that we have the mind of Christ. God, thank you for that revelation, God, and thank you for faith in it. Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord, that we know that we have your mind. Even now, we repent 
moment we decide to turn away, to change our minds and to make an irrevocable decision that we will not go back to anything that is not like you, anything that is contrary or outside of your word or your perfect will for us, God. So we thank you, Lord, even tonight as people sow seed, as they pay tithes and give offerings. Thank you that you increase and multiply it, God, a hundredfold. Thank you for continuing to be provision for every saint of God and for always covering us with your blood, God. We thank you for your goodness, for your love towards us, Lord. We love you. We appreciate you always. And we thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. All right, y'all. I think that's it. All right. So praise God. Again, you need anything, please let us know. Um, and otherwise, I will see y'all in the comment section on Facebook Live um, for Gen X as well as for the kingdom's sake. And with that, I say good night and God bless you. Good night, y'all. All right.